Hello, all you fine bronies and pegasus sisters. Welcome to the show. I am the man, the myth, the hypocrite, Silver Quill, and I have taken over the MBS show for a new format change. Huzzah! But that doesn't mean that I've thrown away the old guard, for with us is Planeswalker extraordinaire, Norman Sanzo. Hello, my precious. Now you have joined us in this evil episode. <laughs> Thanks, Skeletor. Yes. Who's apparently been reading Lord of the Rings. <laughs> What podcast would not be complete without a Pokemon? Please welcome Torterra with 324. See, I knew these colors would come in handy. A villain episode, and I'm red and black, but with a little bit of purple. Isn't it just itch lordy? Maybe just a little. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, red and black versus black and red, is there a huge difference in the ordering? I really don't know, to be honest. <laughs> well, if it's black and red, the red is assumed to be accents. If it's red and black, the black is assumed to be the accents. Yes, and but what are the others going to be, I think, more aesthetically pleasing? Ah, uh, depends, depends. Like, if you're talking about Fire Emblem Tree class, whatever it is, that new one, they call themselves the Black Eagles, but in reality, they're just the Red Birds. <laughs> uh, alrighty then. Well, before the audience gets bored and says you can kiss our assets, <laughs> we're here to talk about Frenemies, the most antagonistic episode of My Little Pony, French Miss Magic Season 9. I say most antagonistic, but that's because it features the antagonists. And so before we get into the actual uh, show, we need to talk about first impressions. Norman, what was your first impression? Oh my, I'm taking the helm on this one. Usually you are. (laughs) Okay, all right. So anywho, this episode was a lot of fun. I like the start where we get to see more of the villains. We haven't seen them in a while now, and... In this episode, we get to, well, see what, quote-unquote, they are doing. And it seems that they're like a bunch of soror- sorority figures just lounging around doing nothing. And yeah, it's a buddy buddy cop? I want to say buddy cop. It's a um, getting-to-know-you kind of movie. Well, what, what's that movie genre called? I forgot. I don't know if there's a genre for this as it's just... Get getting everyone together on an adventure. Yeah, but you know the genre where oh I don't like you, you don't like me, and then once we go to this adventure, in the end we kind of like each other or we respect we respect each other, something like that. It's, it's a, ah, the Sundre kind the of Sundre adventure. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> I never knew it was called that. It's not like I want to conquer the world with you, Baka. <laughs> oh, no, we're going with this kind of talk now. Oh, come in this eye. All right, so Torterra, your thoughts on this episode? Well, I really loved the episode. Like, after the episode was done, I literally wanted to go back and watch it again. I enjoyed it from beginning to end. I loved the comedy and everything. Excellent, excellent. And I loved it as well. I think this is just a, a lot of fun. It's interesting how much more interesting these villains are after they've been uh, dethroned, after they've lost their power base. Because then suddenly they they are at the world's mercy. And uh, it's just more fun to see them struggle. I guess a villain who's completely on top, always has all the power behind them, is intimidating, but not necessarily interesting. It's kind of like uh, Cell in Dragon Ball Z and his quest for perfection. He was interesting because he couldn't just transform at will. And I point that out because, you know, he's a bug and Chrysalis is a bug. So, you know, two and two. <laughs> True that. But I, I just don't know. Like, the... Villains, they, they seem like they're just roommates that don't get along. <laughs> well, we're about to get into that as we te- we cover the opening of the episode. For meanwhile, at the Hall of Doom, Grogar is ser- seeking his ancient bell, which is uh, very stylized. However, he is consistently interrupted by uh, basically each member of the Legion trying to uh, sway him in their favor, you know. Be my buddy. Be my support. And so uh, he's had he has quite enough of that and silences all three of them, quite literally. And now saying, you must work together so that we can defeat Twilight Sparkle and her friends. <laughs> so, Norman, what, did anything jump out to you, uh, jump out at you over this opening? It's like, I just like how Grogar here is just like, you know, I'm scheming and plotting. Oh, I'm looking at this spell. And before he could explain or monologue cozy just comes in and just says oh t-rex 
left the food out again, and then T Rex just comes in. Don't believe her. And Chrysalis just says, "Okay, when are we going to conquer the world? I'm tired. I'm a queen, you know." <laughs> in the end, like he just says, "Shut up. <laughs> We're going to do this. You guys got to work together to rule Equestria. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I just know you're going to do it." And Torterra, anything jumping out at you? Well, for one thing, uh, do they even have a fridge? Because how could T-Rex just leave the food out again? <laughs> the one thing that really caught my attention, probably you save it at the ending, but the one thing Grogar says to T-Rex is, I don't trust anything you say. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's going to come back to bite him. Yes. Actually, that does up some supreme irony in this episode. You guys are knowing stuff that I don't. That's not fair. No, it's it's in it's within this episode. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And for me, there is uh one, the fact that he he goes into this antechamber where they all have carved seating, and lamps. It's like, wow, Grogar, you've really uh, worked on the feng shui at this place. <laughs> Even has doors. <laughs> Why is your central layer this mossy, fetid swamp of a place? The rent is cheap. <laughs> the rent is cheap, but the, the, the health hazard, man. I don't know. Have your meetings around the table. It seems far more uh, user friendly. And there's little cubbies and alcoves and doors, mm. and you know maybe there's a fridge. There you has know, to little, be. Uh, How else would they keep the food? Yeah, maybe a little college fridge in one of those rooms. Yeah, probably, probably. Uh, but I, I just like this scenario here, where the roommates—they're like they're evil roommates. Like they are. Could you just imagine um SNL skit where evil doers are just doing normal stuff? And you know what? I do like that idea about evil doers doing normal stuff. C- could you just imagine well um Dr. Ivor Robotnik just going grocery shopping? That's not every that's not something you see every day. That's kind of cool. Well, I, I'm rem- reminded of, uh, from Dexter's Lab, the Justice Friends. <laughs> Three superheroes together to face the challenge of everyday life. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember that one. So having a, vi- having a villain version of that, uh, not too hard. There's also the anime Sunred, where mostly it's the hero just trying to do everyday life, and as is the villain. Mm-hmm. And- Even though the villain really wants to fight the hero. <laughs> And here's something. Um, I I mentioned um, Robotnik, and in the cartoon Sonic Boom, there's a scenario where Robotnik or a- Doctor Eggman goes to a convention where he collects. Let's just say a pony convention. He goes there, he collects little figures, and he meets up with Amy, and they become best friends. And okay, they become best friends because of ponies. And then they do their work. Uh, Robotnik try to conquer the world. Sonic and his gang defeat him. After the defeat, he talks to Amy. Oh, are we going to meet up this weekend? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's it's a different scenario. That, that cartoon's great, by the way. Naturally, <laughs> of course, nothing can nothing can stop fandom friends. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Never. <laughs> well, after the opening, we of course have the first act in which Cozy Glow is trying to befriend and therefore manipulate. Uh, T-Rex and Chrysalis. But uh, it doesn't go very well. Let's just put it the simply way. So, of course, the, what does a pony do when they're faced with an impossible challenge and heavy resistance? Well, of course, a musical! So we have a new way to be bad. da dum da da I thought it was a better way to be bad. Is it a better way to be bad or a new way to I be bad? I think better. On the wiki, it says better. Well, then it's a better way to be bad. It better be bad. <laughs> Otherwise... You're not going to win. But their musical talent goes somewhat underappreciated, especially by Grogar, (laughs) who reveals the legend of Gusty the Great and how she stole his bell, and therefore a good chunk of his power. So he commissions them to scale Mount Everhoof, which is like, oh, the ease of this task is laughable until they're actually there. All right, let's switch things up just a little. Tartara! Yes. What of this first block jumped out at you? Well, I'm kind of a bit lost with Gusty because I know that, you know, old MLP stuff. I'm pretty sure you know about all that stuff. <laughs> but, um... Meh. Meh. I didn't say it specifically. I was just pointing out that, you know, Gusty's from the old generation. Not saying that you are old. I'm pretty sure you're very young. <laughs> Meh. 
But I do like how it was slowly being set up, and they had to go through a musical number to, I guess, get Grogar's attention. And I guess this is kind of a test to see if they work together? Well, that is the plan. That's the theory, anyway. But, uh, yeah, he, he's going to see it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman, did anything jump out at you? I, I just like Cozy Glow's plan. And her plan is, okay, um, let's do what Pony do. I create this kind of uh, banner. Um, I'll get uh, T-Rex and Chrysalis to come to the meeting. And do we, and then we do a team building exercise. And we'll be great friends. And I'm just thinking, Cozy, you're brave. You're one brave pony. The way that she acts around two of the most dangerous villains in MLP is like a stroll through the park. What? Again, it's because they're, they've bottomed out. I mean, here's Tira trying to bench press, and she's just sitting on top of the bar. <laughs> I don't know how much that Philly weighs, but it's if someone came by and just randomly added weight to my a uh, bar while bench press be like what the hey also spotter please <laughs> Wait, spotter do you bench press yes i bench press huh i did not know that do you even oh. lift Tara? dude i don't know does do you even <laughs> do you even pose i can do a lot of poses oh god but the other thing that stands out is the song i i like this song somehow this song is awesome <laughs> Oh, it is. But the most stunning thing about it is that uh, it's a tango. It's a tango, really? No. I listened to the beat and I was, wait a minute, is this a tango? It feels like it. But to me, a tango is a very, uh, shall we say, sultry dance between a couple. So, you know, this is like, well, now. Yeah. but He gets. <laughs> but at the same time, too, if you notice uh, some of the tones, like the part where, okay, once everybody's getting into it, you get to hear the song really get. You get to hear the song really ramping up, and then uh, you hear what Chrysalis and T Rex trying to take control of the song. I, I just love that part because it makes the sound or makes the song really pop. I think what they call harmony or something like that. I'm not sure. I'm not a musical guy, but I know what I like. It actually kind of gives me that Disney song vibe. Like, you have you have those Disney villain songs. I don't know. It just kind of reminds me of that. I mean, if Girl Girl all of a sudden decided to join in and sing, it'd kind of be like, be prepared. And not really, but I know what you mean. And by the way, Silver, uh, at the end of a song, you get to see uh, Cozy Glow um, biting on a rose while um, I don't know what's that thing she does with the Twilight doll. And, She's draping the twilight all over her legs. So, yes, it is kind of like a tango ending. Yeah, and look at T-Rex and Chrysalis, the pose. <laughs> do you even pose? <laughs> what about you, Silver? What pops out? Well, like I said, the tango, I do love uh, how as they start to – they all start to get in on it, but that means that Cozy's no longer in charge of the song. <laughs> so she's all, that's my thing. <laughs> yeah. And so her her plan completely black backfires. Plus, they're both both Chrysalis and Tyrk are far better singers than I would have given them credit. You know, Chrysalis is played by uh, Brenda McKip. She voices Trixie. Mm -hmm. So Trixie has a good singing voice. Actually, if I recall, I think last time I heard Chrysalis sing was back in season two. But I'm not 100% sure if that's her. Was it? Yeah, Chrysalis had her own little moment of singing this day, Aria. Yeah, but I know. But was it her singing it or was it a voice double? She did also do a reprise of uh, This Day's Been Just Perfect, you know, when she's conquering Canterlot. Yeah. True, true, true. Well, I'll go double check. And um, if you guys want to carry on, you can go ahead. I'll just double check for you guys. And then there's Grogar, who probably doesn't have the best singing voice. That was something that gravely. Well, but it like, was... Yes, I need. I knew way to be bad. <laughs> but it stands out. But... It's actually funny how you mentioned Grogar's voice because uh, when the credits were rolling, I mean, I'm just talking about the credits, not really spoiling, but when the credits were rolling, I saw the voice of Grogar. So, you know, I did a little bit of research, I looked it up, and the person who did the voice of Grogar in this generation was also the announcer for Dragon Ball Z. Oh, really now? Which version? The ocean dub or the Funimation dub? I think it's the Funimation dub. Ah, all right. And, by the way, I'm looking here and it says Brit 
clip does sing the song, but uh, over here she it says that uh, she provides the voice of Princess Cadence. And other than that, I'm trying to check out what other voices she does. I know that she plays um, Trixie and Chrysalis. No, wait, oh uh, no, sorry. She does Princess Cadence? Yeah, that's the only thing, really? Huh, you would have thought that. She just voices the one character? Yeah, I'm just trying to double check because I know. <laughs> she has the one character to rule them all. Oh no, oh no, that's, it. that's not true. Say, isn't it so? Well, it is Cadence. She basically just says, everyone, please help me. Okay. Uh, and that's how she rules. Okay. Uh, give me a second. Hey, okay. Uh, Queen Chrysalis is voiced by... Oh, no. Wiki, why you fail me? Oh. Uh, Kathleen Barr. And Trixie is voiced by... Should be Kathleen Barr, too. Yeah, Kathleen Barr. Huh. Okay. Huh. All right. Uh, I am wrong. So, Britain McCrib is Cadence. And Kathleen Barr voice. Uh, all right. No, the more you know. Sorry. <laughs> do, 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 do. Now, one other thing I really enjoyed is the visuals of Grogar uh, telling the story of how Gusty the Great stole his bell. Now, Gusty has, fitting of her name, she seems to have very breezy mane and tail. But she's a pegasus, so I assume she just runs really fast. <laughs> or she's very gusty. I, but it's not another case of like uh, uh, Celestia, Luna, Mistmane, and Sombra having the wavy mane. Although, why not? Have so much flight magic that your mane's all wavy? Wouldn't that be something? Fan artists, get on it. Yay. So, but, but, but I do love the visuals of just this pure black on a tan background and moving parts. Especially the giant Grogar head. Ah, I have you know. Hey, she took my bell. <laughs> Hey, call the police. She took my bell. Stop her. She's cheating. <laughs> and by the way, um, the song Better Way to Be Bad, uh, the voice of Chrysalis is, yeah, Catherine Barr. She sung herself. That's cool. Oh, there you go. But basically, we now have a test, a quest. Now, is this a side quest or a main quest? Or well, I think the side, uh, t will handle the side quest, but... Uh, no, but this leads us into the second part of the episode, where they actually try to make the trek. And boy, does that not go well. I mean, you have Chrysalis, who's trying to navigate the horrors. The thing is, she's the greatest horror in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> then there's Cozy Glow, who meets a pony with a... She meets Rust Bucket, a pony with a bucket on his head. So he's good on branding. Even in the Frozen Wasteland, you have to say on brand. And t well, uh, in true survival instinct, he makes uh, furniture. Oh. So I think I think he plays Ark, Survival Evolved. Oh, so basically he went to Ikea then. <laughs> Maybe that explains why the Legion of Doom lair is so well thought. Because t did That's all right. the decorating. <laughs> he reads Better Homes and Dungeons. Oh, no. But basically it, it ends in abysmal failure for any who try to scale Mount Everhoof. Until Cozy Glow reunites with T-Rex and basically begins to get really, really ticked off. Because T-Rex has just been sitting pretty. <laughs> and their argument, and their argument is cut short thanks to the appearance of the Ophiotaurus. How do you even remember saying that? <laughs> the Ophiotaurus. <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> Can't even say that fast. I had to slow it down there. All right, and I think, if you don't mind, I will start on this one. All right. So, my favorite parts in all of this was, one, Chrysalis just, uh, there's this darkness around her, even these burning red eyes, and she just hisses, and everyone else is like, okay, we're good, we're good, we're cool, brah. Cool, brah, don't, don't, don't hurt, brah. Peace out. And also, Chrysalis transforming into basically ev all the all manner of mythical creatures and a goat. We've seen this far, it's, We've seen her impersonate ponies, but now she's really using her changing powers uh, to navigate the environment. Mm -hmm. And that's really something. I, she'd be an even uh, more formidable enemy in a fight if she took on a cragodile and tried to bite ponies in half. <laughs> yeah, you say use the elements. I say use the assets that they still have. <laughs> well, there's that too. I mean, if you can conquer the world on a budget, so much the better. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and of course, they're seeing Cozy 
trying her her ever so sweet. Oh golly gosh, Mister, could you help me? <laughs> and Russ Bucket pulls out the Journal of Twilight and Friends, and you just see Cozy's attitude break. <laughs> yeah. let, let the Shirley Temple fall away, and let the I don't know Annabelle take hold. <laughs> Probably. Oh God. I mean, her her uh, her line: "The ponies are supposed to do what I ask them to do." It's like my thing, okay? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And Tortera, what what uh, jumped out for you? Well, you pretty much took the words out of my mouth because I agree. I love how Chrysalis went through all this by changing her forms because we always see her changing into ponies, but now we see her transforming into the rock, the goat, and everything. And I love how. Cozy Glow was trying to be like, oh, golly, can you help me climb up? I'll be your friend. And then he's like, no, I can't help you. It says so in the journal. And then Cozy's like, no, I don't want to be a friend anymore. <laughs> yep. And then T-Rex just getting the campsite ready because he knows that they're going to come back. He's like, eh, they'll be back. I'm going to relax. So does that does that make uh, T-Rex the smartest of the group? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> I mean, there's the scene where he blows dust just to check the wind, and it basically spits it back in his face. Is it me, or is the show playing the villains down? Like, just imagine this. Back in season four? Did t Rick appear in season four, right? Uh, yes. Right. Uh, in season four, he was this menacing... Uh, creature doing all this stuff. Right here, you see him doing stuff like, oh, let me blow the wind. Sand going in my face. Ah, blah, 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 blah. It's like, they're kind of toning him down and making him more quote-unquote relatable. Well, in fairness, he didn't have to face wind in the first, uh, in the in his first appearance. Yeah, true, no? <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe that if the Pegasi had just blown dirt at him, he'd be like, ah, my one weakness. <laughs> Curse you, Wonderbolts. You're so useful and totally awesome. <laughs> Oh, boy. I mean, according to T-Rex, though, he had to deal with Cozy Glow snowing while in Tartarus. Oh, oh, oh that's just painful. Oh, that's that's rough. <laughs> and then Cozy brings up how T-Rex mentions his gram-gram while he sleeps. <laughs> Don't you bring up when we do this? Oh, boys. Well, he's got family issues, as we, le- oh, as we learned from the comics. Mm-hmm. But, oh, talking to gram-gram. I bet at that point he's actually glad the the Ophiotaurus attacked. And me next? Yes, yes. please, Norm. Uh, what, what stood out to you? I know, I mean, T-Rex. T-Rex in this whole scene, like, you, you were thinking like, okay, what, okay, testing the winds and stuff. Okay, that, that's logical. All right, 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 right. What else was he doing? Oh, picking up vines. Okay, well, what is he going to do? Suddenly we see that, oh, wait, he's just building camp. Uh, what, What's your plan, T-Rex? And suddenly he just, okay, I know you guys failed. Even Grogar said so. Now, uh, tell me everything you learned and don't leave out the details. And yeah, the, to me, that's working smart, not working hard. And yeah, I have to say I'm impressed. And Chrysalis um, attracting the uh, Officiotaurus. Um, Doesn't that happen oh, well. after the commercial break? Yes, oh. we're, that's in the next oh, block. My bad, but anyway, uh, yeah, the whole scenario much fun. Like I think T Rex was the one that stood out more to me, and I think what the conversation that Cozy Glow and T Rex had, like they are an odd couple. <laughs> the oddest. I know. <laughs> I'm cute and lovable. But anywho, carry on. All right. Well, yes, the Ophiotaurus attacks, and surprisingly. Uh, T-Rex and Cozy are a bit put off by this. It is big, bigger than them. And fangs. Lots of fangs. Well, okay, two fangs, but they're big fangs. <laughs> Until a female Ophiotaurus appears, and surprise, it's Chrysalis, draining the love and having a little bit of a snack. <laughs> that, actually, you know what? I just figured out. They don't have a refrigerator, but they keep all their food in one of Chrysalis's Bug sacks. Coc- cocoons. Uh, that's it's, disgusting. No, that's why the T-Rex wanted to leave them out. <laughs> See? Scary. Head cannon confirmed. Oh, yeah. But over the course of a campfire, they all get to talk about how much they hate 
the ponies, which actually creates a bonding moment. Oh, isn't that so sweet? Mm -hmm. And and so one harassment of of Rust Bucket later, they scale their way to the top and acquire the bell through teamwork, only to insist, no, we can't be friends. (laughs) Oh, boy. Friendship is like a disease. I won't let it infect me. We'll hold off on the epilogue until we've all had our say. But in this chunk of time, Norman, mm. what did you, what did you say? Look at that's went woo. I don't know. I mean, first things first. Um, the Ophiuchus Taurus uh, trying to get a get get hook up with Chrysalis, and yeah, the, the way that whole animation plays out. Now we get to see how the Changeling suck the love out of their victims and whatnot. And Cozy is gross by it like gross ugh. and just the whole scenario of them needing each other and chrysalis not agreeing or not wanting to do it um what else yeah and then going up to buckethead was it a rust yeah, bucket. bucket and scaring the ever-living crap out of him yeah poor guy and from this point on we, we get to see them working together solving the problem and yeah, they, they work well together. And I think what one of the key points here that uh, we're missing out is that for them to get through the barrier that was put out by Gusty Glow, Gusty Wind, Gusty the Great, yeah, whatever, um, the Great and Powerful <laughs> Gusty, is that T Rex needs to suck the energy out of Chrysalis. And Chrysalis says, I don't believe you. Once you suck me out, you're not gonna get. You're not gonna give me back my energy, and yeah, T Rex says, "Um, I'll return it, quote unquote." Yeah, nor- really, Norman, suck you out. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> but anywho, yeah, I-, I just love the whole scenario here. Them working together, and it's a lot of fun. Alrighty, so Tortera, did you find something fun? Yes. Oh, I found everything fun. I, I love how they how we're having a lot of continuity around the campfire, <laughs> mentioning about their past defeats and how Twilight's always panicking and Chrysalis Lily changes into Twilight and mimicking her, which is kind of hilarious seeing that and how they're all getting along. Oh. And it was actually also nice to see Chrysalis still using her changeling powers to like transform to an Ursa of Minor, I believe. Oh, yep, it is, it is. And ju- just to move like a giant tree, and then after she throws Cozy Glow as a rock, and then she goes over with the monkey. I-, I like how she's not just changing into a pony and changing into other forms. And then I also like, too, how uh, the- after Chris is like, you betrayed me, and Cozy's like, no, nah, would we ever do that? And Chris doesn't even have to say anything. She just points, and she's like, are you serious right now? <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, um, Silver... The form Chrysalis took as a monkey, did that ever came previously in a previous episode? Not that I recognize, no. Huh. That is an act. So, so much for just simply reusing assets. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, like, if it's true, then, oh, wow, um, this creature could just be one a one-off that doesn't make sense. <laughs> All right. It's probably one of those things that only appear once and never again. Yeah, I know, right? It's always possible they had the assets ready, but they never got to use them. Probably. Or it could be one of those assets that came from Equestria Girls. Probably. Or maybe we're just worrying too much and it's just fun to see a monkey. Monkey! Monkey, monkey, monkey. (laughs) Monkey! Monkey! I can't say monkey in my native language because it'll sound wrong. Wait, your native language is what? French? Portuguese. Portuguese. Wait, you're Portuguese? I'm European. Oh. But I live in Canada. Ah, all right. Then I thought you were Canadian. No, I mean, I am Canadian, but I'm also Portuguese. Ah, all right. Then, all right. Then. I can't say monkey in my language because it will sound uh, kind of weird. <laughs> Why? Go ahead, man. I dare do, you. Do you really, do you really want to know what, what a monkey is called in Portuguese? Yes, I dare you. All right. Well, a monkey in Portuguese is called a macaco. Macaco. That's not bad. Well, it's, it's until they throw their cock <laughs> at you. You see? <laughs> That's silver. Do you expect anything less? Well, I mean, I know that he like, he was throwing his balls at me. <laughs> at Con. My blue master balls. <sighs> and then he held them. Mm. Yes, I had him by the balls. Mm. <laughs> oh, yes, it, 
And you can see that video on Torterra's YouTube channel. Oh my. Yes. <laughs> All right. Silver, what about you? Good. Oh, oh, Norman's trying to get off this. He doesn't want to talk more about the macaque. <laughs> I think it was kaku. But kaku. Yeah, it's macaque. Oh, you're really going to want to argue this and give me more openings? Yeah, why not? Sure, why not? <laughs> I do love the villain uh, bonding scene, just because talking about... some, It's funny that sometimes a mutual dislike can actually be the basis for a friendship, as long as you move beyond it. Uh, and we, we get just a cameo by Twilight, because sometimes uh, it's like Twilight is almost a requirement to appear. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. She is the main, main character. I'm jumping ahead, but... Uh, I was just writing the episode follow-up for She Talks to Angel. Oh, nice. And and I got a joke about how Twi- Twilight, oh, hi, Twilight, you're here for your obligatory cameo? Thanks. <laughs> so, but it was a clever introduction. I noticed that none of us have really talked about Rust Bucket. Yeah, that's true. There, There is that great scene where, where the villains, <laughs> further feeding their mutual dislike, there's the, that great scene where they uh, basically bury him under an avalanche. Mm. And you can hear him. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, he's it's like, fine. okay, you, you can put them all at ease, but, uh, I mean, he thinks he's a guard. Is this like the worst post in all of Equestria? How badly did you have to mess up as a royal guard, uh, to get posted here? That, or even if he knows that he's a guard for the Celest, for Celestia, it could be one of those situations where Gusty was just, I need a guard for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You random citizen, you shall be my guard. And the person says, oh, really? Yay. Am I getting paid? Yes. 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 I go now. Well, that's the, that's the question. It did, is this guy like the last of a long line of defenders? In which case they've really let themselves go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Though I could see Russ Bucket on a quest to redeem his honor or restore that of the, Guardians. That'd be funny. I mean, I haven't seen the season finale, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be the hero of the season finale. <laughs> Yay! Oh, wow. I shall not discuss the leaks. Oh, no. Don't, don't. No, no, no. Mostly because I don't like leaks outside of a stew. This one is episode 8, right? Uh, I haven't checked the number, but it's pretty early on in the season. Yes, episode 8. We've got a ways to go. Yeah, this is episode 8. I also enjoyed Chrysalis uh, as they reach this place with a magical barrier and the idea is combine their magic into T-Rex. All I could think of was Noah Antwerler and his uh, betrayal song <laughs> as, as Chrysalis realizes. Betrayal! Betrayal! Betrayed me! Betrayed me! <laughs> Some jokes never die. And, and Chrysalis does look truly pitiable Mm -hmm. while she's lying there depowered and helpless. And yet it's she who, I think because of that vulnerability, she's the first one to just freak out when she realizes, wait, no, we're becoming friends. No, I will not allow this. (laughs) Considering she lost all her hive to friendship. It would make sense. She's the most on guard against it. True that. Oh, I'm just guessing if she's doing a business and having a business partner, eh, it won't be her thing. It won't be her thing, but uh, basically she's the one who proposes backstabbing Grogar, which I love how eager Cozy Glow is to get it on. <laughs> I, I just like her line, oh, I love a good backstabbing. <laughs> er, <yeah. laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and so for our for our epilogue, we return to hmm, the Skull Chamber? Is that what I should call I it? I don't know. Um, the Legion of Doom? The, uh, what, what was it called? Um, well, everyone, may, everyone makes the Meanwhile the Legion of Doom or the Dr. Weird music. <laughs> but that's... It's not... I can't call it Skull Mountain. Ramsgate? <laughs> Why not? Oh. Okay, I'll call this place Ram- Ramsgate. Ooh, I got a better one. Walmart. Oh, that's too evil. <laughs> you monster. Let's see here. Actually, uh, that's a seaside town in England, <laughs> Ramsgate. I, I probably shouldn't besmirch their good name. Besmirching. <laughs> but 
basically they all here's the thing at the start of this episode grogar says i don't trust anything any of you say Mm -hmm. and yet he trusts them when they say they failed and they're basically hiding his bell behind a pillar meanwhile grogar creates his own exit which I got to say, that's not going to do well for the feng shui. I mean, the T-Rex probably look at that like, a, well, now I've got to put up some curtains or drapes or something to restore the flow. <laughs> oh, boy. He'll probably, like, get together a bunch of moss and vine and just make a pulley system. Oh, yeah. But we end on a shot that, that indeed, the bell is in their possession. It's their, it's their ace in the hole against the much more powerful Grogar. And we are left with the cliffhanger of what are they going to do with this bell? Bum, bum, bum. Mm-hmm. So, no, we, we were not trying to spoil the later episodes for you. It's within this episode that Grogar basically says, I don't trust anything any of you say. Oh, you failed. I completely believe you <laughs> because you're, because you're so pathetic. Yeah. Oh boy. Even, even in this scenario here, like I'm just reading from the gallery here, and I think what um, was it? Yeah, Cozy Glow says uh, we, we were sorry, Almighty Gorgar. T Rex just says we work together as you ask, and Chrysalis just says we just aren't as powerful as you. I mean, like this is just red flag, red flag. No, oh, he has to have noticed it. Yeah, I mean. Knowing how evil he is, I'm just guessing that he knows that the villains has it and just playing them for a ride. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I suspected as well. But we'll get into spoiler ter- ter- territory if we go that yeah, far. I know. But basically, the minute they started acting all polite and begging, you're like, wow, guys, you're at a 10. I need you to bring it down to a 6. But that is Frenemies. And, well, I think... If we've said all we can say about the parts, let's go for final thoughts, eh? Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Torterra, your final thoughts, please. Well, my final thoughts. I really enjoyed this from the beginning to end. I liked the comedy. I liked how everything went with the villains not getting along, but then after they start getting along. And the thing that like kind of bothered, bothered me is that how, like we discussed earlier, how Gogar says that I don't trust any of anything you say, but then when they're being like, you know, being suck ups and saying, Oh, you're so powerful for us. And then all of a sudden he believes them and makes a new door. But another thing too, is that when cozy gets the bell, it's just, you know, normal. But then once they bring it into the lair, it starts blinking like flashing. <laughs> so you gotta think, uh, Norman, get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even thinking that. Well, I don't know. I heard you giggling once I said flashing. Oh, God. I, I, okay. I'm just thinking that, okay, Grogar's up high, looking down upon them. And then, like, hey, guys, what's that blinking thing at the side of the wall there? <laughs> I mean, it's oh. my smartphone. I left it on vibrate. Oh, okay. But that's that's the thing too is they literally hide it behind the pillow. Like, what are the chances that Gogar's not gonna like walk by, maybe go to the washroom, or <laughs> maybe make a new doorway, and then he's gonna find it right there? <laughs> well, I'm sure they'll they'll hide it in an even darker alcove, probably right behind oh, him. Boy, maybe. But uh, I'm I'm probably going too much into this. But yeah, just just that little nitpick because like I mean, Grogor is the father of monsters and how he created basically all these creatures. And it's like you created these guys and you're trusting them on everything they say, even though earlier you said you don't trust anything they say. Kind of suspicious. <laughs> well, there's a question. Okay, he definitely didn't create Cozy Glow, but did he create the Changelings and the Centaurs? <clears throat> there. There's a scary thought. I don't know. The thing is, like, what what does he create? What 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 is his creation and whatnot? Because it's not really defined. Like T Rex here, judging by the comics, uh, has pretty good family. Like, okay, they're probably evil, but they're politically correct or politically right. They do things by the book, and when they rage war, they do it by the book too. Follow the rules. See. It- they didn't strike me as evil. Not great parents, mind yeah, you. I mean, I'm just saying because if they're evil, created by the evils, they're probably doing things right. I don't know. I'm just saying. Huh. It's the evil family. 
They're created by the evils. Yeah, that's my final thoughts on this episode. Excellent. Norman, your thoughts on the evils? I like this episode. At first, okay, I, I'll disclaimer out there. Uh, for this episode, for this one, I've watched the leaks earlier on. And it was not in English. It was in, what was it again? Um, in a, Dutch, I believe. Was it Dutch or was it another episode? Well, Portu- something, I, I don't remember what was, like maybe European. I mean, uh, I haven't seen the leaks, but I remember Question Your Daily making a Twitter post saying something made an early release. No, that one was for something. The, something dark side, <laughs> young Scott. No, that one was for the previous other episodes near the end. Um, so you're going to say something? I was just saying something. Something dark side, young Skywalker. Yeah. But but anyway, uh, like I was mentioning uh, when when I saw this, I saw the leak version, not in English. I think it was in uh, European language. I don't know, and reading or just looking at Chrysalis change into Twilight and her not doing the Twilight voice properly, I'm just thinking in my head, oh, uh, they just used the Chrysalis voice actress to just play Twilight. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see what happens. And when the English version came out, oh, that was just played for laughs. They didn't use Terra Strong for this one. Oh, okay. Oh, who would have thought? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, they are just sitting around the campfire having a good conversation, so it's not like she really needs to get into character. Yeah, but it, it does explain a few things where, okay, Changeling can change and perform. So basically, when they transform into a character, they don't automatically get their voice. They have to change their voice to get the voice. You know what I mean? Which might explain why they're so bad at impersonations and attitude. They're too busy trying to maintain the voice. <laughs> Probably. They need to take voice acting lessons. Oh, I know a few people who can do that. Ooh, what if we got the Method Mayors to betray everyone and make them uh, Changeling supporters? Oh, wait, the Changelings are good now. Okay, we're fine. The Method Mayors help Chrysalis. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but other than that, um, Grogar here is menacing, but that last part there, like, that last part there seems like, okay, he knows what's going on, but he's just acting dumb for the other so he can betray them later on and he is really into the whole friendship thing do you notice that oh yeah well he yes and no he's into the teamwork because he realizes that's how the ponies win but he's oh notice that he never takes the lead on trying to establish those friendships he's like i demand that you work with me okay now sort it out yourselves my stories are on you mean my telenovela? <laughs> yes, my telenovela. I think today's the day they find out who's the father. Again. Gasp. Oh, boys. And Silver, what about you, my friend? All my method actors. <laughs> well, I love this episode. I, I love the... I love how each villain approaches the problem, how they play off one another, how they're simultaneously petty and menacing. All at once, they have this great range. It's like for a little while there, you're lulled into the sense of security. Uh, and then you remember, oh, right, these are villains. And they're actually kind of competent. <laughs> and just when you think they're about to become actual friends, no, it will not claim me. It's just a, a grand time. And I, I think one of the best episodes of this season. Mm, all right, all right. I, I got a question. What if Chrysalis just says, yes, it feels good, and carries on the feeling of wanting to be friends. Do you think she'll transform or she needs to release the love? I think she'd still stay rotten because they're sort of based on this mutual uh, hatred of ponies, of, of they all want to be in charge. I think that's not necessarily love. Familiarity, but not necessarily love. Mm, okay, so basically, even if she accepts the friendship, she won't transform into the gummy bears. Nope, nope, she won't become the te- the neon color bug pony. Okay. Shoot, I had a thought in my head, but it is completely blown away. Oh, no. I feel like there was, something, there was something I had, but it was missing. Right. It's been blown away by Gusty. <laughs> by Gusty the Great, her spirit lives well, on. Well, you try to remember that, Silver. I- I'm just going to ask Tara. Tara, you you seen G1 ponies of this? Like, Grogar, have you seen it before? Nope. No way. Eh? Oh, okay, because... Oh, I'm a newbie. <laughs> You're a newbie, all right. So, what do you think of the scenario here? Like, with 
the teamwork that they're trying to do. Like they're not doing it well, and I'm not sure. Like, are they doing a good job? Not necessarily. Hmm. I don't really know how to what to say to that. Because, like, they start off with, you know, bickering at each other and, you know, pointing out littlest details and bugging each other for something. And then after they start working together, but then they decide, no, we're going to turn on Grogart. And then there's that whole thing with hiding the bell and stuff like that. Oh, all right, all right. Right under his nose. Silver, you remember what you wanted to say? Yes, I did. Actually, it's two things. First off, with the trio, you ha- we have an example <laughs> of a triad. Uh, basically, this is a relationship in which th- three relatively equal powers are all stuck in sort of a status quo. N- one can't make a move for fear of the other two, and one can't make a move against the other for fear of how the third will intervene. Basically, given the chance, they'd all uh, want to take control and subvert the others, but it's this very fragile balance of power that keeps the group dynamic going. It's the it's the opposite of a trinity, which is more the divine dance, the interplay. You're not afraid to work with the others and learn from them and grow, which is what you get maybe with Celestia, Luna, and Twilight is a trinity. Mm. But I also remembered uh, the discussion of agape, the love between friends. Mm. And there's something C.S. Lewis talked about uh, with agape. Depending on your friends, your best and your worst traits are reinforced. So if you're friends with a pretty rotten character, for whatever reason, they'll bring out the worst in you. So in some ways, this episode can be tragic, as they've made friends with the worst possible influences for one another. Such as when Chrysalis tries to convince them that they don't want to be friends, so they don't want to uh, work together. Or rather, they, they'll they work together for a good backstab. And it's, but there's an element of tragedy in all this. If they had managed to befriend anyone else, they might have had a road to redemption. But right now, they're actually worse than before. <laughs> but honestly, do we want them to redeem? Well, in truth, I've always wanted Chrysalis to be renegade for life. My, my hope for these three has been that at by finale they're basically three anti-heroes running off into the sunset before they can be arrested (laughs) there's one thing i remember that we didn't cover at all and that's them talking about discord did they talk about discord they i don't i don't remember they did actually Here's, here's the line discord was really something until friendship ruined him ah yes well that's what uh t Rex played on when to get discord on his side (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Continuity. Hey, now you know Safi's not here, so but uh, you do owe me for that. What? You owe me a quarter. Yeah, licensing. Oh, okay, that's not bad. That's my shtick. But given that we've been here before, I think you owe me at least twenty dollars <laughs> by now. Wait, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you people st- keep stealing my bits, <laughs> so I'm taking your bits. <laughs> oh, but you were saying something, Silva. Well, basically, yeah, Discord, he's changed a lot from his his villainous days. Mm -hmm. But that's not a bad thing in my eyes. True. In all honesty, I think that's more scarier. The previously, okay, the chaotic evil guy now becoming the chaotic neutral is much more scary than evil. Like, with the evil, you know what you're expecting. With neutral, like, you got no idea if it's a joke or is he malicious. Hi, I don't trust neutrals. With enemies, you know where you stand. But neutrals, how very neutral mm-hmm. of them. Well, there's that saying: keep your friends close and enemies closer. Yeah, and we... well, but where do you keep your ne- where do you keep your neutrals? <laughs> uh, no sure, man. Uh, inside great balls. <laughs> uh, but with Discord here, I think Flatish has got that covered. Mm, you know what I mean? Oh, all the shipping, <laughs> all the Thank shipping. Thank you, Angel. And, and I'll handle the shipping. <laughs> Oh, uh, but anywho. All right. Well, if we've had our fun with this one, it's that we must now look to the future. For next time on the MBS show, we'll be talking about Friendship is Magic issue 69. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. 69. I'm not going to be able to get through that episode review without giggling. 
But basically, uh, join us next time for a comic review. And, well, it's been fun being the uh, host or moderator for this year's podcast, but now it's time to turn things back over to Norman Sanzo, for he has many thanks to give. All right, then. Thank you, Silver. Anyway, if you guys have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at com. You can reach the show's Twitter at show. My and my personal Twitter account is at Norman Sanzo. Silver, where can the good people find you? Or you can find me on the YouTube on just do a search for Silver Quill or After the Fact, and I shall appear. I am on DeviantArt under MLP Silver Quill, where I post goodnight comics and uh, also a lot of assets for my videos. I'm on the Twitters under MLP Silver Quill, and I post on Equestria Daily, usually on Wednesdays. But also, I just uh, wrote up the follow up for She Talks to Angel. Mm -hmm. So you can find me. Just check Equestria Daily, and you, you'll find me. And you can also support me on the Patreons under Silver Quill. And by the time this podcast airs, I may also have a Kofi in place. Oh, wow. So a Patreon and Kofi. That's cool. Yes. Anyway, yeah. But that's all the places for me, because otherwise I'm going to just run myself ragged. All right, all right. And Tara, what about you, my friend? Well, the good people can easily find me on Facebook, DeviantArt, Twitter, or YouTube under the name Tortero1324, or they could just simply do a Google search, and I'm pretty sure I'll be on all of those. And they could also donate to me on Patreon, and even the smallest donation will be greatly appreciated. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And also, please subscribe and read us on iTunes, YouTube, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date, and Stitcher Radio, and also like our Facebook page. You can also catch us on com. Links are in the show notes. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash the MES show. With every support, you'll get a week's early access to review and discussion podcasts, exclusive and deleted content. And a huge thank you from me. Talking about thank yous, I would like to thank Amy, Lucky Knight, Master of Lag, and also Tristan. Thank you so much, guys. You're great. So anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am the Silver Quill. And I am Tortera. And we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode of the MES show. See ya! Adios. Bye-bye. Yes, being evil is evil. Although that's still better than being an Ophiotaurus. Oh. Apparently you can kill the gods by burning its entrails. Ooh. Sounds so dark. What now? And smelly. Smelly.